When you join the quilting community, sooner or later, you'll have the opportunity to enter a quilt swap or a challenge. And challenges can run the gamut of color, theme, or purpose. My next guest, Sarah Muslim Lefebvre, was my MQG mini quilt swap partner for QuiltCon 2021. And she has entered the challenge category at QuiltCon for the last four years. And she is going to share her process and some tips so that you can enter them this year too. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea. And here's my interview with Sarah Muslim Lefebvre. So welcome, Sarah, to the show. It's wonderful to have you here today. Thank you for inviting me. Whereabouts in the world are you coming to us from? Uh, I'm actually right now located in Baltimore, Maryland. So you're a member of the Baltimore MQG, aren't you? Yes, I'm a member of the Baltimore MQG and also my original guild in South Florida, the South Florida MQG. Are they big? South Florida is pretty decent sized. I think we're up to 120 in that guild. And my Baltimore guild, I think, has about 80 or 90. So how did you come to quilting? I actually do not come from a long line of quilters. <laughs> I, for whatever reason, had always wanted to make a quilt. Um, and about in 2013, I had a friend who had a child turning one year old. And I thought that was going to be a great opportunity. A, gift, a quilt would be a great gift for them. And so I gathered the materials I needed. I got the fabric at a big box shop. I used a friend's sewing machine and I threw together a patchwork quilt that was not very cute, but it was cute back then. <laughs> uh, I threw together a patchwork quilt in about two days, surprisingly. Um, and so that was my first quilt I made. My mom has informed me that my great grandmother on her dad's side was a quilter, um, but I've actually never seen any of her quilts or any of her work or anything. Nobody taught me how to quilt. My grandmother didn't teach me how to quilt. I learned almost everything from watching YouTube videos and trying to figure out, figure things out on my own. So that's kind of how I got here. And how quickly did you start designing your own patterns? I started designing my own patterns pretty much immediately. I had never used a quilt pattern before. I never knew how to read one. And so I just started designing my own right away. Almost everything I've made has been my own design. Not that I don't like patterns. I just like my own design. I like designing quilts a lot. So what do you do in your day job? Well, I actually do two things. So I have two careers. My first career was in sports medicine. So I am a certified athletic trainer. Uh, and I provide health care for student athletes and athletic trainers really work in a lot of different industries. Uh, so I did that for 15 years. And then I left that full time and I went back to school and got a master's in health administration. And so right now, my full time job is working at a hospital system locally here in their performance improvement and innovation department. And we work on improving processes and trying to make healthcare better. And then I still do practice on call uh, for my athletic training job. So I'll actually be going to work a football game later on this evening. When did you realize that you liked precision and especially in your quilting and that you were different from maybe other quilters? You know, I think I've always been a precision person. I think that's just kind of something in my personality. And so when I started quilting, that was just always going to be a part of it. I don't know that I feel like I'm necessarily different from other quilters, but just that we have different styles. You know, some things are different or more important to different quilters. Um, precision is one of the things that's important to me. And so I really try to work hard in my workmanship and construction techniques to try to obtain that precision. Now, you are part of a group of quilters who do like that precision. How did you get involved with them? Like, like I'm thinking off the top of my head, cotton and bourbon. Is it I am spicier or I'm spicier? Nelson, mm -hmm, I yes. am spicier, yep. We all met pretty, you know, serendipitously through Instagram, really, just commenting, making messages to leaving messages for each other and those kinds of things. And we all just sort of became friends that way. I don't think it was the precision that necessarily drew us together. Or maybe it was because we all kind of make precision like quilts. I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> but it just sort of happened. Have you ever done any pattern testing? I have done pattern testing twice. 
I did one for Audrey of Cotton and Bourbon for her indigo radial quilt, which is not hanging over there anymore like I thought it was. <laughs> and I also tested a, I forget the name of the quilt, it's a monkey by Jenny Haynes of Pepper Sexton. So I met you through the MQG mini swap. Yep. That was the year that we couldn't meet in person. Your skills and your technique just blew me away. But you have done the swap, I think, almost every year, haven't you? Not quite. I think I've done it three times. Uh, I did it the year before I met you uh, with Susan, who ended up being our swap fairy. Uh, so I did it with her, and then I had you as a partner, and then I had one other swap after that. I didn't do it last year, and I'm not signing up this year just because I know myself. I'm I'm actually back in school now, um, so I'm obtaining a doctor of public health right now. And so I also have classwork. And just knowing myself and how much effort that I do put into my work, it was pretty stressful the few times that I did do it, trying to make sure that I got something created that I was hoping my partner would like. And then, you know, having it done in time to take with me to QuiltCon. And now on top of dealing with classes and things, I'm actually probably not participating this year either. So I've done it a few times though, and it's been fun. Well, the year that I did yours, I can remember really enjoying doing the, the piecing. But when I got yours, I thought, oh, I just kind of t phoned in the the, the quilting because yours was so beautiful and I I was so nervous to do the quilting I wish I uh, had another opportunity to try that again oh no it's wonderful I have my minis all in a collection over here you know you get something diff so different from everybody so it's really fun to see what you get from other people so do you put a label on your quilt I do yep is it a specific type or is it different every time uh, they're different every time. I don't have like a fancy label maker or an embroidery machine. So I just use uh, my Micron pens and I write the label every time. So last year you had a very clever quilt at QuiltCon. It had impact in red letters on white and then a very faint intent behind it. I thought that was extremely clever. Where did you get the idea for that quilt? Well, the idea for the quilt spawned from an interaction that I had with a quilter on Instagram DMs, which I'm not going to go into. I don't actually know where some of my ideas come from. It might be the shower, you know, something like that. And I played around with that one for a long time in Adobe Illustrator. I designed most of my work in Adobe Illustrator. And I actually had to test that a few times um, to make sure that the letter, the words would show up the way I was hoping they would. Um, you know, with the one really big and bold in the front and the other one sort of appearing to be behind it, but still legible. Um, and I think that was more of like a, that might've been a shower idea, to be honest. <laughs> well, speaking of shower, I hear that there was a bleeding issue on that one. So I've had two bleeding issues on quilts. Yes. Yeah, so that one was probably the worst one I've ever had. I'm, I've always been a pre-washer, so I could try to avoid those things. So all of the fabric had been pre-washed. So I will start with that. But I am also a quilt blocker because I really tend to do very dense quilting and that can sometimes warp the quilt. And so I will block my work to make sure that I can get it squared up and straight and flat again. And so I put that one in the washing machine. I don't usually wash it, wash it, but I put it in with just water so that I can get it nice and wet and have the spin cycle do some of the work of getting the water out. And when I took it out, I put it on my drying mats that I use and I was looking at it and I thought, you know, I swear it looks like there's a little pink around that A. I can't quite tell because, you know, it was faint, but it was there. And I, I kept looking at it and I'm like, am I going crazy? Do I see, do I see pink around that letter? Did this bleed? And so I let it dry. And then when I lifted it up on the back, it 1000% bled, the red bled all over the place. And so I was very upset and frustrated because that the words in that quilt are constructed out of quarter inch strips. And so having done all of the work to piece all of that and then have it bleed everywhere, I was very upset. And so I actually put it away for almost a year before last year's quilt con deadline. That was like the last quilt I worked on. I thought, okay, it's already ruined. I could make it worse or I could make it better, but it's already ruined. So it's either done, done, or I'm going to be able to salvage it and enter it again. So I actually trimmed the size down a little bit. Uh, the width was pretty much the same, but I, I had it uh, to where the length was a little bit longer. So 
I took out some of all of the accent quilting I did. I trimmed it down and then I rolled the dice and I put it in the tub with as hot a water as possible, boiled pots and pots of water on the stove. I put it in there with, I use Synthropol usually to boil my fabrics in to release all the excess dye. I put it in there, swished it around and I think I did it twice and I laid it out to dry and the bleeding had come out. So, so it does work. Adventure. Yeah, it does work. Yeah. And you mentioned you had a problem with another one as well. Yes. So my fabric challenge quilt for this year, uh, it wasn't as bad. So again, I pre-washed the fabrics and I did not boil these. I've, I've started boiling all my fabric now with Synthropol before I use it at all. These I did not because these are the Wyndham, uh, the wovens that are the fabric challenge fabrics this year. So I just pre-washed them because last time we used these two years ago, they did not tend to bleed or have a lot of excess dye in them. But when I blocked this quilt, um, some of that real dark purple in this, in a, just a few of the seam lines had bled into what is like the really very, very light blue. So again, I had to do a synthropol path again. So it worked both times. It did. Yes. So okay. I, this is the way I will always do it from here on out if I ever have that problem and hope for the best. Do you sure. pre-wash your batting? I do not. I do not pre-wash the batting. Nope. The top, you do the back. Mm -hmm. How much shrinkage do you find with the batting? Luckily, have not really experienced a lot of shrinkage with the batting. I also do not put my quilts in the dryer at all. So if I were to wash a quilt or even for blocking the quilt, which needs to be wet anyways, but I do not put any of my quilts in the washing machine. I mean, excuse me, in the dryer. And I know on a lot of the packaging, they say how much shrinkage you can expect. But luckily, I have really not experienced very much shrinkage when I wash. You know, I experience shrinkage when I do dense quilting. But I don't think that's from the batting. I think that's just a, a factor of the dense quilting. Do you pre-wash so, your batting? No, um, okay. except for when I'm making things that are going to be washed often. So uh, okay. like um, a placemat. Hmm. Or, but I don't throw it in the washing machine. I grab two, like a, a pillowcase and put one on top of it and one on the bottom and then soak it and then just let it dry. Oh, because okay. it'll be a mess if you throw it into the washing machine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I think I've, a lot I've... of people don't realize that when you say pre-wash, you don't necessarily have to use soap. <laughs> right. Like really what you're wanting to do is get it wet and let Correct. it shrink. Right. Yep. Can you tell me a little bit about the quilt that's behind you? Uh, sure. This uh, was my fabric challenge entry for last year's Quilt Con. This I also designed in Adobe Illustrator. I'm a really big fan of paper piecing because that is one of the ways I can achieve that precision that I like so much. And so this was designed in Adobe with all of the challenge fabrics and it's a paper piece design and it's a repeating block. And so I, I actually don't usually do repeating blocks either which you may have noticed in my work, but that's how this one came about. And I just, I really liked the shape. It's a part of my, I actually started a series, a uh, half and half I'm calling it. And so I designed this with that series in mind actually. So with the half, half square triangles and then half and half of the pattern kind of on each side of the block. And so that's where that idea came from. That that really is stunning. So have you made any commercial patterns or are you just making patterns for yourself? I have not made any commercial patterns. Uh, I ju usually just do them for myself. I haven't ruled it out. Maybe in the future, if I can think of something that might be friendly for a lot of different people. Um, but right now I just make them for myself. So I have a technical question here because I have this problem. You've got beautiful blocks. They're nice and square. They go together. But I often find when I quilt, they get skewed. How do you stop your work from skewing as you work through it? As I'm quilting it? Yes. Uh, basting. Basting it really well to make sure that it holds down. You know, I also got a, a new machine at QuiltCon 2020. Uh, I got a, a bigger machine that can actually has a stronger motor and can actually pull the weight of the quilt with the dual feed feet that I use for walking foot quilting. And that helps too. And then also making sure that I have 
the quilt weighted correctly on this side of the machine and on that side of the machine. So it's not pulling or, you know, struggling to pull or those kinds of things. So it's usually just really good basting and making sure that the quilt is supported while I'm quilting it. Now, if I follow your feed, I understand that you have some roots in Afghanistan and you use your platform to spread the word of how people can help some of the Afghan population. Mm -hmm. uh, have you brought in quilting for that at all? You know, I have an idea that's percolating back here in my head that I don't have quite figured out yet how to do the design, um, but I do have an idea for that. Yes, I do. There's a lovely picture of you meeting your grandmother. Mm -hmm. Was that before you were quilting or after you were quilting? That was about, maybe about seven years before I started quilting. Yeah. Did you notice any of the local textile crafts while you were there? I was there because my father passed away. And so the reason I was there was for a funeral, really, and not for something joyous or just for a, a, a visit. And, you know, my family there, my cousins, I have a lot of family still there. Um, and they said, you know, if you weren't, if, if the reason you were here was just for a visit, this would be more of a celebration and more joyous. Um, but because I was there for to bury my father. Um, it was not really, I didn't really go anywhere. I didn't speak any of the language at the time. Luckily, I had a few cousins who did speak very good English that were able to do some translation for me. Um, but I didn't really go many places. It was very, I mean, I feel like I was watching myself in a movie the whole trip. Like I can tell you from start to finish everything that happened and different things I saw. And, you know, I was meeting everybody for the first time. And so I didn't really get to explore any of like the textiles and things. I, you know, the region where my father is from, Kandahar, they are very well known for this very exquisite embroidery work that they do. Um, so this is. Wow. Isn't that nice? Is that woven? It's embroidered. Did you see someone doing it? I did not. My dad actually bought, you know, had this made for me on one of his trips back there before he passed away. So in 2000, and it was actually early 2006. Yeah. They have videos of people doing this online. I mean, this the hand embroidery work that the women do there is just, I mean, it's incredible. This is all handmade. So have you done much traveling for quilting? I have not, actually. I usually try to go to QuiltCon every year. Um, and that's about it. I've gone to a few of the Houston International Quilt Festivals, uh, because I had the MQG has or had an exhibit there, a special exhibit of modern quilts. And so I've had a couple modern quilts get into that exhibit. And so I would do basically an overnight trip. I would uh, not even an overnight trip. Sometimes it's a day trip. Like I would leave, I left Baltimore. I think I went twice from here. I left Baltimore very early in the morning and came back very late at night and just went to the quilt show for the day. Um, but I usually go to QuiltCon every year since 2019. I've done that. Have you become a teacher of quilting? I have not actually officially become a teacher of quilting, but my Baltimore Guild, they did ask me to design our community challenge quilt for QuiltCon this year. And so I designed that, that quilt and then sort of ran a workshop for the members that were going to help assemble the quilt uh, a couple Saturdays ago, actually. Um, but I have not forayed fully into teaching at all. So do you know when you're designing a quilt, whether you're going to enter it at QuiltCon? Not always, I guess. I think it depends on what the design is, really. I mean, I think not every quilt design we come up with is going to be suited for QuiltCon. And sometimes I think I have a hard time finding categories for my quilts in other shows because they were in QuiltCon. And, you know, there's some crossover between the shows, but... It depends, I think, is the answer. It just depends. So what pointers would you have for somebody who has never entered QuiltCon before? Um, the first thing I would say is if you have never entered it, you should, because you can't get in unless you enter. <laughs> and then the other one would be A is really good photographs. I think that's the biggest thing, making sure that the quilt is centered in the photo, that it's you know clear light. You can see the whole thing. There's no distracting backgrounds, which... They have their webinars that basically tell you all the same things, but I think basically having 
uh, very nice quilt photos is going to be a, a big assist. And then just do it. Now, I have mentioned your precision, but is that the favorite part of your quilting for you? Or is there another favorite part? I think my favorite parts are the designing and the precision and then quilting them myself also. I really like doing a lot of walking foot, straight line quilting, um, and then trying to figure out, you know, how I can enhance the design that I made with the quilting that I'm going to put on it. That's a really good point. Like I've often thought, why are we not thinking about how we're going to quilt it when we design it? Mm -hmm. This always seems to be a very much an afterthought. It depends for me sometimes, you know, while I'm designing it, it might come to me and I'll say, oh, I should do the quilting like this, or it'll come to me afterward. I'll have to sit there and stare at the top for a minute and say, okay, what am I going to do for this? Like for the one behind me, when I was trying to figure out what to do, I just didn't think that straight up and down lines would enhance the design. And so I went with the lines at the angle that kind of matches the design in the quilt. And so it just depends again on the quilt that that I'm working on, what the best design is going to be. I think sometimes it's, it comes right away and sometimes I have to think about it for a few days. <laughs> so what was your beginner mistake? I will say my beginner mistake that I made on that very first quilt I was telling you about was doing free motion stippling with the feed dogs up. <laughs> I really had no idea what I was doing. Like I actually don't even really love stippling on my quilts, but you know, I was trying to find a way to get it done and trying new things. And I was borrowing my friend's machine, like I said, and I'm pretty sure I did all of that. It was very hard to do. And I'm pretty sure it's because I did not lower the feed dogs. I didn't even know what feed dogs were. And I didn't block the quilt. I didn't square that quilt up. So it was wavy and it, it was a hot mess, but it was going to a one-year-old. So it was fine. So your mom is not a quilter, but is she a crafter? Have you in it? Like, are there crafters in your family? There's not really crafters, but there are artists. So my mom is a very talented artist. She can draw. She's very good at sketching and those things. My grandfather, her dad, he was an artist as well. So he worked in watercolor and he was very good at watercolor. Um, my brother draws. Um, so we have some artists, yes, but not necessarily crafters. Have you experimented with any other fabrics? I have not really experimented with anything outside of regular quilting cottons and quilting fabrics. I did try using metallic thread for the first time, and that's on that quilt, and it was wonderful. I'm very excited about using that again in the future. A lot of people have problems using metallic thread. What was your secret? I think my machine just liked it. I didn't have any trouble at all. It might have been the brand I used too, the way they make the thread possibly. I had no trouble at all, so I I don't know. The quilting goddess was shining yeah. on you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Out of all these amazing quilts that you've made, do you have a favorite? I don't know. You know, the one that I just finished is usually my favorite at the time. I would say I think I don't have any that I hate or that I don't like. So I like everything I make, but... I would say probably my favorite is the one I just finished, which is not the fabric challenge, but the one before that. It's called Ordinary World 2. I am going to enter it into QuiltCon, yes. And hopefully it will get in. <laughs> How's your long arming going? Um, I'm definitely getting better. My problem is that I have deadlines. Mm. And I often don't have the moment to enjoy things. And I'm trying very hard not to put those deadlines in place. Like... Mm -hmm. If it gets done this week, it gets done this week. I'm still very much in the learning phase. So I'm still learning about how to use certain stitches a certain way. I've been doing a lot of free motion quilting, which I like. And I have found that instead of just doing one shape all over the quilt, it's so much easier if you use two. Mm. It's, with a long arm, you've got this shape and you've got to be able to do it upside down, sideways, flipped over, right. attacking it from the left, attacking it from the right. And I often will get these spaces. So if I can work with two different designs or motifs, I should say, I find it a lot easier to get the even coverage that I need. Got it. But I have Angela Walter's voice going on in my head the whole time. Yeah. Like yeah. it's more important that it's evenly quilted than it's perfectly quilted. Right, right. Yeah. I do like doing ruler work. I saw... Uh, Audrey did a uh, 
I think it was a short or a reel that I saw about like Loading micro it. adjustments that need yeah. to be done because she is just so precise in her right. thing. And that never, never even occurred to me that that was an issue. Yeah. So, she's had a long arm for a long time. So her and my friend Kelly Spell, they, they both have been long armors for a very long time. And so they really have kind of figured out their machines and they know what adjustments they need to make and tiny little tips and tricks that are yeah. probably helpful. Yeah. And she's just looking for that precision, precision, mm -hmm. which I often just don't have the patience or the time for, but uh, it's thrown some interesting things at me. Um, yeah. And I like to problem solve and I like to find shortcuts and things like that. Right now I've tried to do a quilt as you go on the long arm. Okay. Do all the piecing and quilting on the long arm. And just, you know, just the mental exercise of doing that. Like it's different. Don't know. I've I've done it with a panel in the middle and then borders going outward. I, I don't think I'd do that again that mm. way. I don't I don't have the precision in the quarter inch the way that I have when I'm sewing it on a sewing machine. Okay. And doing it this way, I have to constantly roll it forward and roll it back. Yeah. But I think I would do it again if I could do it as a row by row. Okay. So as you, you're just working down the quilt and you could quilt as you went, as opposed to just piecing it all together and then getting back to it. So yeah. I've learned a lot of things, learned a lot of things about what works, why, why people don't do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and it's what I can totally bring back. Beast. Yeah. But what I can bring back. I got an embroiderer. Uh, module last year and I finally started using it and I was able to incorporate a couple of the techniques that I learned in embroidery in this project oh, good. because in embroidery they always do a line of where the piece is going so that you can accurately put it on got it and then you tack it down so I was trying that technique with this and I think it it really helped doing it here the blocking that I did down I did with washable thread okay that's, that's the one thing, like, even though that you can hide the stitches on the front, you don't see those stitches anymore. They're still on the back. Right. You know, I'm not freaking out that my back has to be perfect, but I also don't want it to look like a dog's breakfast. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, there's a couple of stitching lines that I'll be able to wash out. So that's okay. just Okay. Well, it's always fun when you learn a technique in one thing and you can apply it to your quilting work that you're doing. Well, there's always techniques that, I I push myself away from like last year I took matchstick quilting with Cassandra Beaver at QuiltCon mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and I've seen your quilting and it's so beautiful but I can tell that that's I took the class so I knew how to do it but mm -hmm. it just really affirmed that well one I didn't like it because I didn't know how to do it but two it really isn't my my you thing. You can enjoy it yeah. But now I know how to do it I can incorporate bits of it I don't have to do an a whole quilt of matchstick quilting. I can right. just use a, maybe it's a placement that I do or something like yeah, that, but it, it's a sure. skill that I can have in the future. Yeah. Yeah. This uh, fabric challenge for this year is matchstick quilted and it's amazing. So if people wanted to enter the, the mini challenge, what are some of the things that you would advise them ahead of time? Sorry, the mini okay. swap. You know, I would just say try to pay attention to the feedback that you get when you're assigned your partner because they tell you what they don't want and just try to make sure you definitely don't incorporate any of those things. I think the few times that I've done it, you know, the the feedback I've gotten from everybody was like, you know, I like lots of color and I don't like uh, black and white. I think that's what you said on yours or something. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just making sure to design something that doesn't incorporate their don'ts. That was a double negative, but, um, you know, incorporate all of their dues or try to do as best as you can. I, I think it's, that's probably the best advice I can give. And then just make something that, that you think they'll like. Now for the, the challenge cult, you, do you enter the challenge at most cult cons, the color challenge cult? I do actually, you know, I really like fabric challenges and I, I think the reason why I like them so much is because it gives me automatically gives me some constraints to work within. And so like the palette's already picked, you know, now I can just make a design and use those colors. So I enter a lot of fabric challenges just because of that. So when you design your color challenge quilt, do you start in black and white and then add the color or you specifically work with the colors first? 
I start with the design first and then I do color placement. So this was actually not the original layout of the colors for this, but as I played around with it in Adobe Illustrator with different placements of the colors, this was the block I landed on that I liked the best. And then I could repeat it and see what it would look like made. And I said, oh, I like that the best. We're going to do that. Isn't it interesting how you can design something on a screen? Love it. But when you actually make it, it mm -hmm. has an extra life in it, it that does. you cannot get in the flat. Yeah. And I, I get excited because I'm like, oh, this is exactly what I envisioned. You know, when I designed something like the word quilt you were talking about, you know, I could picture it in my head, what I wanted to do, but I couldn't quite figure out how to make it until I started working on it in Illustrator. And then I could say, okay, this is possible. This is what it might look like. And then when it comes to life, it's like, oh, it's an actual object, 3D. And it really just brings the entire thing to life. Yeah. Do you make a practice block? Sometimes. Yeah, it depends. If I have extra fabric, I'll do a test block first. Actually, I do know uh, this actual quilt. When I printed the templates, I forgot to uncheck the fit to paper or fit to size thing. And so it's actually a little smaller than I designed it, but luckily I printed all 48 with the box checked. And since it's a paper piece design, it the, it all still worked out. <laughs> but just remember to uncheck that box. So what is your favorite method for taking out paper piecing? The only method I use is ripping it out and using tweezers to get the little bits. I usually will do it while I'm watching a show or while I'm listening to a lecture or something mindless um, because I can do do those two things at the same time and not feel like I'm missing out on one or the other. At what stage do you take out the paper? I will usually take the paper out once the top is assembled. So because like even this design here behind me, I really wanted to have a lot of precision in the way these offset lines lined up. I was very careful to make sure that after I assembled the top, I took the papers out because, because it's paper pieced, you know, as, as long as my blocks are all trimmed to the right size and accurately, when I sew them together, everything's going to line up just the way I want it to. And so I'll take the papers out after I have the top assembled. So does that mean you press to the side? When I'm paper piecing, I'm kind of forced to press to the side. When I'm not paper piecing, everything gets pressed open. <laughs> It's Open is actually that, my preference, but... It's funny how that has become one of those big divides. I know. It used to be pre-washed or not pre-washed. Now right. it's pressed open or not pressed open. Yep. So what do you do with your scraps? I collect them in a bin here and then I send them to one of my friends that likes scraps. Yeah, I have two bins. They're about, they're not very big. And as soon as they get full, they get out of here. Do you like scrap quilts? <laughs> I like other people's scrap quilts. Other people do amazing things with scraps. I am just not able to do that. Isn't that interesting how I have many friends that are just like you that uh, don't like scraps. Anything less than a fat quarter is a scrap and out the door they go. Mm -hmm. And other people that just work with scraps. Just work with scraps. And they make incredible quilts. I just don't know how, like, I can't do improv. I wish I had it in me and I've tried to go in with a, an empty, clear slate, you know, and just do whatever. And I just don't operate. I cannot operate like that, unfortunately. Although, you know, everybody else's improv quilts are amazing. And I wish I could do that, but I just... I'm well, it's interesting that you say that you don't like improv because a, a number of your quilts give the feeling of improv. Hmm. Like the quilt that you made for me looks improv -y. When I first saw it, I thought, oh, she just threw these things together. And then as I looked at it, I realized, no, these are exact. And They're that you had a couple piece. of different p paper pieces, but overall mm -hmm. it gave that feeling. And you did randomize the colors. I did. So I actually, for your mini quilt, I designed that one in Illustrator also. I came up with a block design that I liked. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to make four or maybe it was three block layouts that are similar to this because for your quilt I wanted to incorporate that one eighth inch strip yeah and I thought well maybe I can place this in different places and then when I you know orient the colors differently and then orient the blocks differently that will give me something that kind of flows and that's how I came up with that one yeah but it was paper pieced yeah 
yep. and beautiful. I love it. And it's funny you mentioned that little eighth because that just makes the quilt. That acid lime pop is one of my yep. favorite things about it. Yeah. So when you're not quilting, what do you like to do with your spare time? When I'm not quilting, I do quite a few different things. So one of them is the gym. I go to a CrossFit gym. Um, I do that. And then I'm also learning Pashto, which is one of the official languages of Afghanistan and a heritage language for me that I did not learn growing up, unfortunately. Over the summer and even now, I'm continuing to uh, participate in a tutoring program for recently resettled Afghan refugees in the Northern Virginia area down in Arlington. Uh, this summer tutoring program we did resulted in many of these students actually improving their reading levels by several grade levels, and we're continuing that program into the fall. And so I do my doctor of public health program, the gym, I do tutoring on the side, and I work at my second job in athletic training still. So I stay pretty busy. People want to get a hold of you. How can they reach you? Um, they can either reach me through my website, which is sidestitchesdesign.com. There's a contact form there. They can also find me on Instagram under the same name. They can send me a message there. If they want to support you with your work with the refugees, what can they do? I would actually ask people to contact their congressional representatives. There is the Afghan Adjustment Act that has been uh, introduced in Congress that is trying to be passed so that all of the Afghans that have been evacuated here can actually have their status adjusted instead of having to go through the very incredibly backlogged immigration system so that they can live and work here in the United States safely. Well, I know you're probably rushing off to your next job. Thank you so much for being with us today and sharing all your tips for the minis and the swap challenges. It's been lovely to talk to you again. Thank you for having me, and I'll look forward to seeing you in Raleigh. I hope you've enjoyed my interview with Sarah. I keep the mini quilt that she made for me close to inspire me to take the time to slow down so I can improve my precision. If you would like to contact Sarah, I'll leave a link to her website and her social media in the video description below. And please take a moment to lend your support to the Afghan Adjustment Act. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing on in the background. I have interviewed so many interesting, amazing people on this show. Let one inspire you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.